Health Advancing California Telehealth Policy. The group was established in 2011 when AB 415, the Telehealth Advancement Act, was introduced and continues as telehealth becomes more integral in the delivery of healthcare services in the state. It's convened by us, CCHP, the Center for Connected Health Policy, and the coalition members' diversity of organization reflects telehealth's potential scope and reach that it can have on health and well-being of the state's population. Through the collaboration of the group's diverse members, the coalition aims to create a better landscape for healthcare access, care coordination, and reimbursement through and for telehealth. Next slide, please. So the purpose and key objectives for today's webinars are to, one, educate stakeholders on how telehealth can be used for mental health during COVID-19, provide an overview of policy supporting the payment and care delivery of telemental health during COVID, share provider perspectives on how telehealth can facilitate care delivery, increase attendee interest in using telehealth to meet patient, health plan member, and other constituents needs, and enhance attendee knowledge of telehealth modalities, use cases, and key considerations during COVID. Next slide, please. We'll have like a brief overview of telehealth and policy, and then I'll hand it off to our panelists who will speak to caregiver, patient, and provider perspectives on how to use telehealth during COVID. So we ask that um, all attendees will remain muted during the webinar. If you have questions, please use the Q&A box, not the chat box. And the, the reason for this is we monitor the Q&A box and we'll be able to uh, see your questions more easily and answer those. Next slide, please. Just a few resources that you may find useful. So these are fact sheets that the coalition has put together that may be useful for, for your work, but also for the people that you may be treating. So they are available on the CCHP website on the coalition section there, and they are free and accessible to the general public. Next slide. And of course, this webinar would not be uh, um, able to happen without the generous support of our sponsors, the California Healthcare Foundation and the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. We thank them and also our speakers for participating and supporting this webinar. Next slide. So this is just a general sort of overview. I'm sure most people are very familiar with the different types of modalities and how telehealth can be used to treat patients. Uh, this is also part of the fact sheets that I mentioned earlier that the coalitions have um, that you are able to uh, access and download. Uh, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I'm sure you really wanna hear from our two great speakers. So we'll just go to the next slide. As I mentioned earlier, I am um, A. Kwong. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Connected Health Policy. Next slide, please. And before I start off any talk, I really do have to start off with a disclaimer, uh, mainly because of how we're funded. We have funding from the federal government and we're grant funded, so they asked me to do these things, uh, these disclaimers, that um, letting people know that any information we provide today should not be considered legal advice. It's only for informational purposes. If you're interested in a legal opinion, please consult with legal counsel and also know that neither I nor CCHP has any type of financial interest arrangement, affiliation or relationship with any type of um, company or product that I may happen to show today. Next slide, please. So one of the things that CCHP does is we do track all the state Medicaid policies these laws and regulations related to telehealth and that's a snapshot of our website. It's an interactive map so if you're interested in a particular state you can like click on it. We are based in California so uh, we do have like a little bit more information probably expertise in California but we do follow and understand what is going on in other states so if there's another state that you're interested in you can get the latest information by using our website. Next slide. Some of the projects that we work on, I mentioned the 50 state report and the coalition. And as well, we are part of the tele National Telehealth Consortium and Telehealth Resource Centers. Next slide. They are one of the generous sponsors of today's webinar. Uh, just to let you know, there are 14 telehealth resource centers. CCHP is one of the two national centers. We focus on policy and there's the other national center that focuses in on technology. There are 12 regional resource centers that cover specific states. California has its own, the California Telehealth Resource Center. And they're really sort of your frontline people to go to first if you have questions regarding telehealth. So they can help with questions all the way from um, program operational levels, how do I get started, to what equipment should I be looking at, to questions about reimbursement. So I really encourage you to reach out to a telehealth resource centers for your first initial questions as well. 
Next slide, please. So I don't think this is any surprise to anybody, but COVID has really changed the landscape for telehealth dramatically. And it's definitely had an impact here on the telehealth policy in California. Next slide. So this is a timeline of some of the federal changes that have happened. There's been a sort of a trickle down effect of like changes that have happened on the federal level that have impacted the state as well. These are sort of the major types of changes that have happened. Next slide. And you see kind of where the changes that have been made on the federal level and on the state level, how similar they have been. They've been really focused on specific areas. Now, there's a lot more on the federal side as far as changes, simply because that has been Medicare policy and pre-COVID-19, the Medicare policy in regards to telehealth was actually kind of like behind what a lot of states were doing. It was definitely behind what California was doing with telehealth policy. But you do see that there is some sort of overlap or consistency in like the areas that they were making changes, such as where a patient is located, what modality you can use, what services would be eligible, and what type of providers would be eligible to provide services. When you're talking about mental and behavioral health, that was actually, even before COVID, one of the more popular sort of specialties where you could use telehealth. And there were, for the most part, um, all of the Medicaid programs and Medicare were reimbursing for some mental and behavioral health services if you use telehealth. Where they probably were running into issues were in some of the other policy areas, such as like where the patient was located, uh, the um, exact services that could be provided, perhaps prescribing. That was where you were running into limitations in a pre-COVID era when you were talking about mental and behavioral health. So while it is probably one of the more popular specialties to use telehealth for, and that was true before COVID hit, they still were also, providers were still facing some types of limitations because of the policies that were surrounding telehealth use in general. Again, where the patient was located, the types of services, and the type of providers who could provide those services. Next slide, please. In California, California actually was in a little bit better position going into COVID as far as their telehealth policies were concerned because California Medicaid actually did a big update back in the summer of 2019 where they did expand their Medicaid policies in regards to telehealth. So they had, you know, sort of less amount of changes that they had to make to um, address COVID-19 and how telehealth could be used, but they still had to make changes in reaction to COVID. One of the big things was the modality. Now, pre-COVID, 19 in California Medicaid, you could use store and forward and live video. But what they added was using phone as a modality. And this was something that we also saw on the federal level and other states as well. And one of the big reasons was not everybody has access to telehealth. They may not have had the adequate connectivity. They may not have had the adequate equipment at home, such as a smartphone or a laptop. So you needed to reach those patients still. And phone was added as an option there to deliver services. FQHCs, federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics, RHCs, they face like limitations on how they use telehealth. That was true before COVID-19. So they, those restrictions had to be relaxed as well in reaction to, to the um, pandemic. And then there was also relaxing some of the consent and privacy requirements in order to facilitate and make more easily accessible telehealth services and to help programs that maybe were just starting or needed to be created in reaction to COVID to allow them to like ramp up very quickly and get started. But overall, the administration in California was fairly responsive in the concerns that were brought up by the telehealth field in you know, using telehealth to address the pandemic. Um, but there was still some bumps there and maybe still some bumps continuing because it took time for systems to, to adjust. So while they may have expanded the policies in reaction to COVID and a provider was trying to submit a, a a reimbursement claim. They may have like run into issues and that may have just simply been a technical issue of like trying to get their systems in place to reflect these rapidly changing policies. And the policies were changing rapidly, definitely on the federal level and on the state levels as well. You had these um, large agencies trying to turn very rapidly, trying to like meet the need, but then you know, probably running into issues with like, you know, how do they process a claim that may have taken like a little bit longer than, you know, some who would have liked. Next slide, please. So for behavioral health, a couple of things that um, Medi-Cal, the Medicaid program in California did say was like, 
remember, you can use telehealth, but whether you're using telehealth in person or telephone, the standard of care is the same for all three modalities. It does not change no matter how you're delivering the services. They made it clear that it was reimbursable in the Medicaid managed care program, um, specialty mental health service program, and their drug medical organization organized delivery systems. And in California, for those who may not be um, in California and are listening from like outside of the state, the counties are very involved with some of the behavioral health services and how they are um, administered and processed and reimbursed. So there was sor sort of at least direction from the state to say like they were encouraged counties to allow the fullest extent and use of telehealth and telephone and delivering services in, in during COVID-19. And they made also very clear that patients may receive services in the home. Again, one of those policies though, pre-COVID-19, you were saying we were reimbursing for mental and behavioral health services, location of the patient, may have been more specific, but during, of course during um, the pandemic when people were sheltering in place, they do wanna make clear that they can still receive services in the home via telehealth. Next slide, please. These are just links to like some of the resources from the state. The, the two previous slides, I was pulling that from the DHCS Medi-Cal payment for telehealth and virtual telephone and DHCS behavioral health information notice uh, 2009. But one other thing that I do want to point out that the state did was that they created a California consumer telehealth website, which has some information for consumers regarding telehealth, but also a really neat feature where you can go in there and type in your zip code and it will bring up all the health plans that service that zip code and link you to that health plans policy to telehealth. So that's actually very unusual. I've never seen that like anywhere else in the country. So that was incredibly um, interesting to see that a state did that. And they did it fairly quickly too. They got it up and running pretty quickly. So that is like another sort of resource that's available to folks to check out. Next slide. But a lot of big questions is, well, what happens in a post-COVID-19 world? Because all of these, a lot of these were temporary changes. What are we gonna do when like the public health emergency is over? I mean, that is a question that so many people have been asking and so many and policymakers have been really examining and thinking about. And there are steps um, going forward to figure out what would be kept around, what should be kept around. There are um, members of the California Telehealth Policy Coalition and other folks who have been talking about like trying to keep some of these more in a permanent state, either through legislation or maybe some action through um, California budget process. But those discussions are ongoing. I think probably most people do wanna see most of these changes stick around. What ultimately does, it's still not clear, but do know that there are discussions and efforts underway. Next slide. And those are just uh, some of the links on our website and resources that we have. We do track what's going on also with the COVID changes on our website. So you can check that out both on the federal and the state level. And now I think that is it for my section. And I would like to introduce our two wonderful speakers today. I'm gonna read their bios just very quickly. And then um, Dr. Wood's gonna go first. But first off, we have Tanya Wood is a licensed clinical psychologist who spent nearly 20 years of clinical and teaching experience. She earned her PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Virginia in 2000 and currently serves as the director of clinical training in the PsyD program at Pepperdine University. She is also the clinical supervisor and coordinator of the mental health services at the South Los Angeles Trauma Recovery Center. Throughout her career, Dr. Wood has worked in a variety of academic, community, and public sector settings with particular focus on providing quality services to marginalized populations presentations on various subjects such as cultural diversity, clinical supervision, community violence, adaptations of evidence-based practices for community mental health, self-care, and professional development. She is the 2020 president of the California Psychological Association. Dr. Wood is married with one small child. She has a practice in the greater Los Angeles area with an emphasis on relationships, women's health, and infertility. Our other speaker is Dr. Denise Gordon. Denise Gordon is a licensed psychologist with a doctorate in marriage and family therapy. She currently serves as the department chair of behavioral health for Borrego Community Health Foundation, where she has worked for the past 12 years. BCHF is a federally qualified health center with 26 clinics and urgent care centers in Southern California, caring for the underserved and underinsured community. As director, she oversees all behavioral health providers, establishes new critical pro programs, and helps grow the department in San Diego, Riverside, and Imperial Counties. In addition to her full patient load, 
Denise has dedicated her efforts to helping the underserved population have greater access to mental health care by increasing awareness and streamlining the referral process for primary care physicians. Uh, Denise was born in Mexico City before moving to San Diego, where she lived until leaving to attend UC Santa Barbara. After completing her graduate degrees at Elliott University, formerly California School of Professional Psychology, Denise moved back to San Diego, where she currently lives with her husband and three sons. Aside from working and spending time with the family, Denise and her husband created the Celebrating Futures Foundation that has raised over $1 million over the past eight years to support neuro-oncology at Rady Children's Hospital, including the establishment and annual funding of a pediatric neuro-oncology fellowship in conjunction with UC San Diego School of Medicine. So we have two very accomplished and impressive doctors to speak with you, and I will turn it over to Tanya, Dr. Wood. Thank you very much. I think I'm unmuted now. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be with you all today. And um, I, I'm going to share sort of the perspective of what it was like on the ground for providers um, in this sort of transition to telehealth during COVID. Um, and I think the best way, this actually, in some ways, really does resemble what my own <laughs> laptop looks like with all of the stickies on it um, during this time period. And so I thought it might be good to first, and thank you again for that introduction, May, but just to kind of repeat what my own sort of roles were that really um, in this time period um, sort of elevated my um, involvement with transition to telehealth. So as mentioned, um, in the introduction, I'm currently the Director of Clinical Training at Pepperdine University in the PsyD program. And so in that role, I uh, assist students in their clinical training placements. I provide supervision of students. And so I, you know, am, you know, overseeing their clinical work and practicum, but also trying to guide and inform their development of clinical competencies. So I had um, many students who were themselves um, put in a position of um, navigating if their placement was moving to telehealth or not and um, their own kind of level of comfort with that. Um, and at the same time, as mentioned, I'm currently the president of California Psychological Association. So it wasn't only graduate students that I was interfacing with during this time period and making this transition, but also um, seasoned professionals who found themselves also in this um, sort of crunch time of trying to adapt their practices um, to, to meet the needs of their clients and respond to the pandemic. And then in, in the middle of all that, in the little time that I have left over, I have my own independent private practice. So I individually was also kind of in the middle of this. So I kind of just show this to give an overlay of, for me, the many different, again, roles that I had in areas in which I was really kind of dealing with and trying to help um, advise individuals. So COVID-19 happens, and I think this is what we all experience, right? And it, it feels like it happened kind of this quickly, and it just evolved so fast. Um, so I borrowed this um, uh, Twitter uh, a diagram from, from this person, you know, that went from Monday, like, okay, no big gatherings of more than 500, and by Friday, it was like stay at home. And I think that we all can relate to that was essentially how quickly that we found ourselves trying to manage um, this huge transition. And so, and for the different roles that I had, whether it was DCT or my own private practice or with um, psychologists across the state, and sort of, I think, I tried to think of the themes that emerged in that really short amount of time. And these were really the ones I think that came up the, quick, the quickest and that we wanted to get the word out, which is my next uh, slide, as much as possible. So the first was the technology and, you know, who had, um, access to technology, whether that was provider and or the clients. Um, you know, I was consulting with some colleagues who up to this point hadn't even used email much to communicate with clients, um, much less, you know, provide video conferencing or telephone based services. So it was about access to technology, um, information of what technology platforms were HIPAA compliant, which were available, what were the costs, what were the fees. Um, so that was one piece of it. But again, remember, I'm the director of clinical training, so I'm also thinking about skill sets and what are the competencies um, that are needed that are much more unique and specific 
to providing services via telehealth. So um, even if you're comfortable with the technology, that doesn't necessarily mean that what we were doing in a therapy session with a client would just organically translate to a video conferencing platform. So there really was this um, need to make sure that we were kind of uh, addressing the technology itself, what was needed, and also the skill set and competencies to, um, to implement effectively. Um, and I think related to this was, were issues of confidentiality and boundaries because that um, was an overarching concern, obviously, for ethical and legal reasons. But now we found ourselves in, in our homes delivering services. So our clients are seeing our homes, we're seeing our client homes. Um, you know, I provided services to clients who are in their, in their cars. Um, and it was, it just kind of shifted again, how we had to think about and introduce this to our clients and think about it also for ourselves. Um, again, as, as May mentioned, I have a small child and, you know, very quickly became apparent that I had to like on my office door at home, <laughs> put a like, do not disturb sign and like lock the door um, to make sure like these are the times you absolutely cannot interrupt me um, for him. And on the same accord, I actually had one of my clients who, you know, we were engaging in our video conference and she was like, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. And um, she, oh, wait, wait, wait a second. And she goes and she comes back and she goes, you're coming in through Alexa because her Alexa was connected to her. And, you know, those kinds of things. So there are all, all these other ways that we have to think about um, the, the, the way that possibly confidentiality boundaries can be violated and how we navigate that in a way, though, that doesn't limit access to care for our clients. And I, I um, apologize if you can hear the noise outside. It's very loud outside. Um, so related to that then, so thinking about then how do we maintain our commitment to privacy and protected confidentiality, yet, you know, ensure access to services, it really did require kind of looking at revising and updating what office policies and protocols were in place that we needed to attend to. So informed consent was no longer, it was not just about informed consent for psychotherapy, psychological services, but it was about informed consent to provision of services via telehealth or video conferencing and all of those potential risks that now came along with it. Um, and so there was a sort of this mad rush to kind of think about what that looked like and how to um, add that in and, and modify policies and protocols for that. Um, the use of like electronic communication, because now everything is being done remotely. So those initial contacts are made through email and are we, how are we getting consent forms signed if they're not coming into the office? And how are we making payments if they're not coming into the office? Um, and if you didn't already have an infrastructure set up to facilitate that, those were huge critical issues that um, you know, professionals were dealing with. And we were even at like a, the graduate school level, um, we were also encountering because we have community clinics as part of our graduate school training. And so we were trying to navigate this um, as well. So I saw a, a small clinic trying to figure out how to do this, um, do this too. So those were some of the things that we were um, sort of grappling with, um, as well as thinking about, but who is this going to benefit? You know, like, is this, um, like I said, it doesn't necessarily automatically translate. And we had to think about the different um, ser the services and the adaptation. And so um, in terms of the population, you know, um, how well will it be received for kids and, and children? Um, and if you're doing a play-based psychotherapy or play therapy, um, how then do you accomplish that in an effective way via telehealth? Um, and you know, there were information and guides and some trainings, um, I think initially put out, and, you know, and some of the colleagues that I spoke with decide like maybe right now we won't, I won't provide services to kids. But I think at this point, now that we're like what, three, four months in, I think um, the landscape is still changing and very different. And so uh, people are getting very creative and thinking of ways to modify and adapt so that there can be responsiveness to providing services to children and families and, and groups even, right? So this idea of um, you know, providing group therapy via telehealth and, and what that means for everyone. And there's also those diversity factors in terms of socioeconomic assess, um, variables and who has access um, culturally, what does this mean? And are there different uh, cultural variables that maybe are more amenable or acceptable or um, open to the use of telehealth? Um, 
And then also a psychological testing. I apologize for the typo on my slide here. Um, you know, there we have now there have been some guidelines that have come out. The Interorganizational Practice Committee of Teleneuropsychology um, provide, well, they provided some teleneuropsychology guidelines to help. But again, there's a lot of adaptations that had to occur in a very short amount of time. And then I think just in terms, in general, there's a Zoom exhaustion, you know, and here's a little um, a funny meme that got me through many, many, many times. I was like, who is really behind all this? Zoom. Uh, <laughs> because I think that in the midst of like, we just need to like get this done, um, on the back end of that was like, and how do I take care of myself um, in, in, the, in, the, in this process? And you know, I myself had to get different kind of glasses with a screen, you know, filter and to help with some of the eye exhaustion I was having. And, and it did sort of shift things like scheduling of clients. And what does that mean? Because at the outset, it seemed really easy to just schedule people back to back to back. And then I realized, wait a second, I'm not standing up. I'm not moving. I'm no longer escorting a client to the, you know, to the door. And so um, different kind of adaptations, I think, on a very personal level as a provider that people had to think about that while there was sort of a different kind of convenience factor where there were other kinds of things to take into account as well in terms of how to um, take care of ourselves in the midst of COVID. So, and um, th those were some of the, those things that, again, in these different roles that I had that I was thinking through in this very short amount of time, but really the huge focus was we need to get the word out because this, these transitions, this transition is happening really quickly. And um, some of the resources that, um, that I use across all the different roles um, and functions that I had were a lot of the telehealth guidelines and best practice. So, so thankful for organizations such as this, who already, you know, back in 2011 was beginning to look at this and, and being able to develop some guidelines. So the American Psychological Association and the American Psychiatric Association, um, there's also the American Telemedicine Association who, who had already put forth some guidelines and we're continuing to kind of add to that to kind of guide and inform those best practices. Um, so that was, um, I think, a, a huge need to get that information out to providers, as well as just information, again, about technology. Um, what was the correct technology to use and all of the concerns and questions and opinions and feedback about what's HIPAA compliant and what we can do or not do. Um, and, I, and I think when the federal, when the DHS was, was trying to help by easing on enforcement of HIPAA, um, that while that the, the gist of it, I think, was to relax and ease to increase access. And in my role as DCT, and as well as the president of the California Psychological Association, and I also had to remind people, that does not mean we don't, we ignore HIPAA. <laughs> you know, we still want to be attentive to what is pr proper and correct. Um, but right now, we just recognize there is sort of a fast and furious transition. Um, so that kind of continued to be a message that actually I still see emails on our listservs about, about in terms of technology and um, what are the ones that still abide by and are in compliance with, with HIPAA and other guidelines. Um, as well as just a comfort. As I mentioned, I, I had colleagues who hadn't even used email to communicate with their clients. Um, and so getting more comfortable with this idea of using technology and not just for the delivery of services, but I think in, in many ways, you know, for receiving payment and um, scheduling appointments um, was also, I think, something that initially um, was part of the um, information and the work that we had to get out. And as I mentioned before, the confidence. And again, I'm sort of primed for that because I'm the director of clinical training. So I'm thinking about student development and their skill sets and um, helping them think about what, what, what has shifted now. So again, it's, it's part of it is confidence with using technology and being a bit facile with understanding you know, hardware and software systems and navigating those but also is the competence of delivery of services in this modality because it is not exactly the same and there are different things to attend to. Um, if you're used to using body language or something in the room, then now you're paying attention to um, voice and cadence and things, other things in a different kind of way. So we had to um, really think about that and, and begin to integrate that into our clinical training for our students. And then there are all the other legal and ethical issues that may provide a great kind of overview of some of the um, 
the issues that we were confronted with in terms of like jurisdiction, ju jurisdiction and where you live and uh, where your client lived. And it was interesting, um, again, on many levels, kind of what I saw providers having to manage. Um, as the DCT at Pepperdine, I have students that are placed across the country. So many of them are here in California, but they may be on internships across, like I said, across the country and other states. And so I was having to provide them information about what their state's laws were, because some of them wanted to come home. These are, you know, students away from their families. They wanted to come back home. Some of them did. And so questions about supervision and if your supervisor and client is in one state, but the person providing the services is in another state, you know, all of those kinds of questions came up and was a lot of, um, sort of researching and digging through and taking advantage of the resources that were presented before to know what those state laws were. Um, and it was um, uh, hairy at times, but I was grateful for access to those resources. So jurisdiction um, and knowing those, um, also thinking about HIPAA and HIPAA compliance. And like I mentioned, again, competence, like really kind of assessing, is this something I am prepared for, that I'm ready for, that I'm, I'm able to do? And then finally, insurance reimbursement. I, that probably could have been number one, because that probably second to, you know, what technology I will use, that, that was the main concern. And I think um, sort of critical aspect for providers um, in the state about what, how, how can we be reimbursed and, and what does this mean for our practice? You know, people are really concerned about their, their livelihood and, and continuing to be able to make a living. Um, one thing I forgot to ask is time check. So please may just let me know when I'm like running short on time. <laughs> Um, so one thing actually that I went through that really quickly, but I'll say like what what's old is new again. And in some ways, after that initial like, I think, two to four week period where we were all like sort of just scrambling and trying to get everything together and I was able to kind of take a pause. I realized like, wait a second, there are a lot of these technology tools that we have already used and been using. Um, but but now it was more out of a necessity not necessarily a choice and so it felt like something brand new but really it was stuff that had already been accessible to us like the phone now granted part of the reason the phone wasn't utilized was because of the reimbursement barriers um but it, it almost felt like it was a brand new thing that we had to do to learn how to like communicate with clients by the phone and talk with them by the phone because of all of those like legal ethical issues that we had previously been um, encountering that now we had to kind of um, think through in a different kind of way. The asynchronous store and forward that we already had, you know, kind of um, had access to before, but now were much more integrated into our practice. Even the video conferencing, as well as really many apps, you know, and I will pause here to share a little bit of my own, sort of my independent practice, what this was like. And I feel fortunate in a way, I mean, I, not that I had any foresight of my own to be forward thinking enough, but just kind of out of necessity had already integrated a bit of telehealth into my practice a few years back. And, you know, as mentioned in my introduction, part of my private practice, um, the most, the biggest part of my practice is in um, family planning and infertility and um, working with individuals and couples who are in using third party reproductive technologies, which is a very niche area. And so it, it's not necessarily uncommon that people from other parts of the state will reach out to me for services that they may need. And that had happened a few years ago. And so um, I was, I, I'm in the LA area, but was working with um, clients up in the um, San Francisco, Northern California area. And so out of that had already started figuring out ways to bring in telehealth into my practice. And so through my electronic medical record system that I had, I already had a built-in video conferencing um, technology. I already had a client portal system where payments could be made. Um, and I had already used something called Psych Surveys, which is an app that you can send um, like outcome measures to clients. And so I had maybe a bit of an easier transition where it just became that this wasn't just kind of a carve out for just a couple people every four to six months, but it became much more standard practice for all of my clients. And so using the apps and video conferencing, things that I already was using was easier for me. Um, but I think helping bring forward like many more clinicians and psychologists across the state into these things that had already been there, but just had never been tapped into as resources. So um, I just kind of wanted to point out that we, I think we, these had already been there, 
and again, increasing our comfort level and I keep reducing those barriers, um, such as reimbursement and some of the concerns about the legal and, and ethical issues kind of helped increase access in a different kind of way for the comfort of the provider. Dr. Wood, I just want to give you a time check of four minutes. Four minutes. Okay, I can do it. Thank you, May. Um, so I, I think the other question that, you know, as providers, we were worried about our clients and their responsiveness. And honestly, I think the public was much, was, was, was ready for this more than we were. Uh, and so, and this one um, article that actually I shared with my students, because I think they were the ones too that had like the biggest concerns about the relationships with their clients and how is this going to work and that um, really, in, in many ways, there's a high level of use of technology and acceptance among clients and that the more we use telehealth, it actually leads to increased satisfaction. Now, some of the variables that maybe um, impact that is the quality of technology. So if you're, as long as, you know, if you're using technology that is, you know, good, um, consistent internet that's very stable and high quality, um, that, that helps the satisfaction, understandably. But it, some of the things that also kind of impacted it was ability to kind of exchange documents. So I mentioned before, like how are we going to get consent forms signed? How are we going to share documents in a confidential uh, manner that's HIPAA protected? Um, and, and, and even though clients are somewhat open and accepting, that may vary, you know, um, across settings and even across sessions. You know, I think the first time that I noticed the difference myself with a client was when um, the client was getting emotional and I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I could hand you a box of tissue. And I, I verbalized that to the client. It was the first time I felt the difference of being on a video. Um, so, so that idea of like openness and acceptance may vary, but for the large part, really, our clients are um, open and um, willing because at the end it really did increase access to services as mentioned i do some supervision at the south los angeles trauma recovery center so low income um, low resource community and interestingly actually our attendance rates improved with um once we transitioned to tell to telehealth because a lot of our clients had transportation barriers and they relied on public transportation and when that was removed and um, we used phone for those who didn't have um, video conferencing capability. Um, their actual uh, attendance to sessions improved. And, and, um, and again, I think that it just kind of increased access to services um, in a way that, that reduced some of the previous barriers that had existed for them. So where do we go from here? And um, again, sort of summarizing what I see, I think this office, quote unquote, without walls is the new normal. You know, I think now that we have gone through that hump of the transition and the comfort level of technology and um, the lighting issues and all those things, a lot of colleagues are starting to give up their offices. They're like, I don't know that I'm going to go back to an office. So I think this is part of our new normal. Uh, I think we also have to really think critically about how we integrate um, training on video conferencing or telehealth into our graduate schools so that our students are more acclimated and prepared for practice using um, telehealth. Uh, I think there's continued advocacy and, and legislation that will be needed, some of what, what May had made reference to um, at the start of this. And I think there's also a need for a kind of increased telehealth outcomes research. There's some that existed um, prior to COVID, which um, you know, suggests that in terms of efficacy and outcomes, uh, it's, it's fairly similar. So there's, you know, should not be much concern about uh, telehealth being less effective than in-person services, but I think there does need to be increased uh, research regarding my, the modalities. Is telephone as effective as video conferencing? Is it, a, is it consistent? You know, are there any differences based on the modality of intervention that is used? And so there probably is going to be much more research coming out um, or will be needed post-COVID. So, sorry to rush through that, but I wanted to get it in before my time was up. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Um, next, we have Dr. Gordon from Borrego Community Health Foundation. So, Dr. Gordon. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, you're coming through loud and clear. 
Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I just have to say, I agree with a lot of what um, Dr. Wood said in terms of the provider perspective um, on dealing with um, all of the changes with um, telehealth. So I'm going to give a little bit of a different angle um, coming from a, an FQHC, a federally qualified health center um, called Borrego Health. I've been with the company um, for 12 years. I'm the department chair there. Um, and we actually started doing telemedicine about um, eight years ago. So before all of this, it was on a much smaller scale. Um, we were just basically set up with some of our remote clinics. So for example, in Borrego Springs, I would be in Escondido seeing a patient in Borrego Springs. The, I would say the equipment was much larger at the time. I think in the last eight years, things have gotten a lot um, smoother in terms of um, making all of the technology work. Um, so it's not something that is completely new, but it has been new organization-wide um, now that most of our services um, have um, need, require um, telehealth, um, but we are doing some for our um, for our primary care physicians in person, but certainly all of behavioral health is um, telehealth now. So Borrego Health is one of the largest federally qualified health centers. We have 26 in um, 26 centers, um, including urgent cares. Um, we have behavioral health, medical, and dental services. Um, and um, so since COVID hit, um, about the ratio is about 80 to 80 to 20 in terms of number of telephone visits that we do to video and in primary care it is um, 90 10 and then um, next slide please um, so some of our locations for telehealth um, as you can see a, a large a, a large list um, there are about 19 centers here um, and I you guys can just see on the screen there um, the wide um, range of centers that we have in the counties. Um, next screen. Um, for the televisit organizational flow, um, this is kind of something that shows the involvement of all of our clinics, uh, I'm sorry, of all of our departments. So even though we as providers are doing the service, as you can see, I mean, it starts with everybody in, in the organization. So um, beginning with medical staff office um, that provide that identify the providers who need to be set up with telehealth, um, the site management. Um, that's determining the staffing needs for, for the providers who are doing telehealth um, and scheduling um, access for them. Our IT that sets up the accounts and monitors access, um, as well as um, the trainings that go into it. So the provider trainings that we've had to do for providers to be able to feel comfortable doing telehealth, provide um, trainings for patients to be able to, um, to know how to access telehealth so it kind of involves everybody um, to the marketing, which um, involves you know, creating the flyers, um, messages, um, things like that, and then the scheduling. So collecting all of the patient's information, um, doing all of the arrivals and the check-ins, um, scheduling everybody, um, scheduling everybody in bookings, and we have um, we use the Intergy system for our electronic health rec, um, system. So all of that involves, um, and then marking the no shows, etc. And then next slide. Um, so then the patient, the involvement of the patient, obviously, um, to be able to identify their needs. What are their needs? Is it something that we can do through telehealth? Do they have to be able to come in in person? Um, but again, with behavioral health, we are doing it only just through telehealth. Um, so the managed care team, um, our own referrals, our behavioral health coordinators, um, really just um, virtually um, putting them into the room so that we can be ready to um, accept them into our, our, um, our space. Um, to the provider who conducts the patient visits, um, sees what the needs are, um, documents, submits the charges, um, and then to reporting. So creating our reporting so we're able to see our number of visits, um, et cetera, any issues that come up um, to billing and collections, um, which they are the ones who are, you know, being able to do the order and the charges correctly, um, and then to audit, to auditing. So verifying our, all of our compliance requirements that we are um, including what we need to be including in, in our documentation. So 
basically this is just a big organizational flow that shows um, all of the different compartments that are really involved in making a, um, a successful um, telehealth visit. So next slide. Um, with our provider documentation guide. So these are the Department of Healthcare um, Services provides guidance for how, how we need to be um, documenting. So the why, so why was the visit conducted via telehealth or telephone? Um, and again, kind of uh, piggybacking on what Dr. Wood say, I mean, I think that the telephone has been one of the biggest changes for providers that we've seen um, to be able to access care for a lot of our patients who don't have accessibility um, that has been a big that has been a big deal for us so being able to document if it's on phone or on video and um and the why why was it conducted on phone or on video um, so we we have to be able to document that there are circumstances that prevented the patient to be able to come in so you know COVID being the obvious one um, so th those are all things that we want to make sure that we include in our documentation um, and then next slide um, so the other thing is that the treating healthcare provider is intending for it to take place of a normal visit, of a face-to-face -face visit. Um, that's something that would be documenting um, that it is a covered service um, or benefit because it is medically necessary. So that's another component. Um, and that the covered service or um, the benefit being provided is clinically appropriate um, to be delivered via um, virtual telehealth mode. So. Um, behavioral health being a, a one that is very appropriate to be able to do um, via telehealth. So next slide. So this is one of the um, prompts that we kind of have um, for our providers to be able to use um, in, in order to, because communicating the changes I think has been very important for our patients. Um, some of our patients have asked to come in, which we haven't been able to do. And so um, being able to just kind of guide them through this process and helping them with their comfort has been a, a big thing um, for us to be able to do so that everybody starts to feel comfortable with this new way of um, communication. So this is an, op uh, an optional script that we have. Since we are doing therapy on the phone or over video, the same confidentiality rules applies as in person. Um, but because we are over the phone or video, I also need to make you aware that you can verbally withdraw consent to this type of therapy at any time while we are using HIPAA compliant approved mode of protected communication. It is possible for a breach to occur because of technological complications. By consenting, you understand that if you need emergency services, the protocol for Borrego Health is still the same. Do you consent to continue with treatment? So as long right now as we are able to indicate in our chart that they verbally consent to treatment, um, that has been enough to be able to justify the visit, which um, is a big relaxation of the guidelines um, in comparison to what this was before. Um, next slide. Um, so these would be the things that we would be including um, in the documentation so that they provided verbal consent to proceed with the telehealth telephone visit, um, that we oriented the patient to telehealth, that we reviewed confidentiality and limits of confidentiality, that we reviewed the risk and benefits of treatment um, in case of emergency, that the patient verbally consented um, for Borrego Health to contact their emergency contact. Um, and that we would include the number. Obviously, not having the patient there does bring up a lot of circumstances where um, we feel you know, that having a, that emergency contact right then and there in that call is very important. Um, if something happens and the patient um, gets cut off, et cetera, being able to have that at the visit is important. Um, and then the patient's address. Um, it's it's and not assuming that they are always in home. I have also had patients who pick up and they're in the they're in the car. I mean, luckily they're not driving, but they're in the car. Um, so just being able to kind of know know where they are is important too. And then um, providing additional resources. Um, SAMHSA came out with a disaster distress hotline. Um, that's also something that we like to provide. Um, you know, just with all of these new circumstances for everybody. And then next slide. So this is just a, um, a picture of what, what it would look like in our electronic health record, um, where we would just have a check mark um, to some of these questions, of the, the points that I just reviewed on them providing verbal consent, et cetera. So it makes it a lot easier just to be able to go down the check mark at every call. Um, okay. 
Next slide. Um, the, be the behavioral health visits, um, can you see the chart? So there's a behavioral health visit graph um, that shows 2019 versus 2020. Um, and I, if you're able to see both graphs, it shows a couple different things. So first off in 2019, the lower line, um, as you were able to see, um, there are less visits overall. Um, and then in 2020, um, there are more visits, but more striking is the difference between the, the visits that happen in the months, you know, March to June, which is everything around COVID. So that, that's something to, um, to keep in mind. And um, next slide, the average visits from January to June. That just kind of explains um, on our in our weeks how much how many more behavioral health visits um, we've been able to have. Um, the average has been about 495. So as you can see, towards the end of the year, towards you know June, they're up all on the in the 600 range. So really, um, there's been a huge increase in terms of access to care um, from measuring from the beginning of the year to now, um, thanks to telehealth. So um, this last graph also shows um, the, the first line on top says Medi-Cal that just, I, it, we mean to say in person, um, and the bottom one is the telehealth. So you can see that in the beginning of the year, there were really no very, very few telehealth visits. Um, and as the months have gone, there are no, there are no in person. It has all been done um, through telehealth. So next slide, why the increase in visits? Um, it, is, it has been a twofold um, explanation the way I see it. So telehealth provides greater access to care by eliminating the barriers that patients have to be able to make it there. Um, so this includes transportation, um, lack, of a lack of vehicles, um, financial burdens, um, uh, living in rural areas, things like that. Um, so the, the other reason is, so the barriers have, have decreased, but the other part is that there is just more of a need now for behavioral health um, with everything that has happened with um, COVID. So um, SAMHSA put out this um, quote that I thought was, was was very telling of the times. That's the current national COVID-19 crisis will certainly contribute to the growth in the number of Americans needing urgent care to address mental health needs, including suicidality. Americans across the country will struggle with increase in depression, anxiety, trauma, grief, isolation, loss of employment, financial instability, and other challenges which can lead to suicide and suicide attempts. Next slide. So here, just, you know, in terms of who benefits, this is a, I look at this as a very diverse picture of who is benefiting from telehealth. Um, these are just some of the cases that I have that I think explain um, the, the, um, the diversity. So one is a 50-year-old with myasthenia gravis, um, a very rare auto, autoimmune and neuromuscular disease who cannot drive, does not have a computer, and sessions are done over the phone. Um, a 13-year-old girl who was home every day since the pandemic with her mother working, um, she does video sessions on her smartphone. Um, an elderly woman who does not have access to a smartphone or computer, but is able to speak to someone over the phone in her native language. Um, a postpartum with a visit with a mom and her newborn baby who otherwise might would not be able to come in. Um, and a patient with severe OCD who has intensified during, which has intensified during the pandemic um, and leaving her room and uh, leaving her home would just be too um, fearful. So the bottom line, the way that I see it is that um, with now the, um, the option for telehealth for everybody, it's providing a greater access to care. Um, the modality of care has been redefined, but I, I think that there has been more benefits in terms of the services available to people because of it. And then next slide. So this, and this is a little bit of a summary of um, a telehealth roadmap, which um, just kind of shows our different phases. So phase one has been like ramping up with our bare bones, just the minimum of what, um, of what we had to do to get this underway for um, all of our, all of our organization. Um, so really it's been organization wide for these last few months. Um, getting everybody the equipment they need, just kind of 
getting through this. Um, the phase two is a little bit more of like stabilizing, um, finding out the kinks and what's what's happened and um, fixing things and, and making sure that everything is um, just kind of um, fine tuning everything that has been put into place. And then phase three, which is a future, is really being able to customize it, um, being able to make things even easier for patients where they don't have to download an app, where there's easier ways for them to be able to get on um, and things like that. So, and then the last slide, so just in, in looking into um, the future, I think being able to rethink on how we can communicate, how we can reach our patients, um, how we can provide care and do it effectively. I think it's a little bit of a reframing in our mind um, and being able to kind of accept some of this new norm and, and, and roll with it. So that is it, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gordon, um, and thank you also, Dr. Wood, for those great presentations. So we have a couple of questions, but if you do have a question, please definitely type it into the Q&A box. Um, the first question that, it, it, this is actually coming from me, um, I actually was having this discussion with a friend, um, you know, in the Asian culture, like seeking out behavioral mental health help is not really something that has is like natural to like us in our in our culture so ha, what has been sort of like the different responses that you've seen from other cultures in not only seeking out help for um, mental health issues but also doing it through technology has it have they been more receptive because it's through technology or have they've even been more hesitant about it i'm happy to to take that one um so I think it depends not just on, um, I think it's a couple things. It's, it's the differences in the culture, but also in the age group is what we've been seeing with resistance or hesitation with using the technology. I've seen that even more so where our older patients feel much more comfortable using the phone instead of the video. And it, it's been, um, that's been more challenging where the younger folks feel a lot more comfortable with technology. Um, so that has been, that's, that's what we've seen in terms of the greatest kind of um, difference with ages. Um, with, with the culture, that I, I, the cultural differences, I think what sometimes is challenging is, you know, we've used a lot of like translation services in the past um, for our, we have um, Spanish speaking um, therapists, I'm, I'm one and there we have quite a few. We have Arabic speaking um, therapists as well for our like our, we have a big Chaldean population in El Cajon and that's been, um, but we've even had some other um, patients where I feel like because we've used technology in the room with the patient in person, like I've used it for Russian um, and a couple other languages, that's been difficult. Um, and even getting to set up the appointment if they're not, if we're not seeing them in person, I think has been has been challenging. Um, so I, I I saw a bigger difference in um, in the ages. Going back to your question, versus like um, culturally being able to to reach patients. Yeah, I I can chime in. I, I would say it was sort of probably similar. Um, and if anything, maybe there was an increased receptivity to the telehealth. Um, um, for, for the many reasons that were mentioned in Dr. Gordon's presentation in terms of you know, reduce the barriers of things like transportation. I think it just, um, you know, it, it, it sort of put a different span on the idea of, of asking for help and receiving help. Um, and in my own, in my private practice, most of the recent clients I've gotten have explicitly stated when they reach out that they are seeking someone who will do telehealth. So. Mm. Um, actually, the a question came in that's piggybacks a little bit on what you mentioned, Dr. Gordon, on the use of the technology and the age groups. And you also mentioned in your presentation that there was a high utilization of telephone. So there has been, you know, questions of like, you know, is telephone as good as like live video or is this telephone as good as in person? So what, what are your views, both of your views on like that issue with telephone? Um. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and try and, um, so I think it depends on, um, it, it's hard to say, 
I think there are benefits of, there are obvious benefits of the video, which is you are getting, especially for the first session, being able to see a little bit more visually um, the mental status that they're in. Obviously there's a lot of body language you wanna be able to see. There are things that are, um, that you would like to have that you don't have when it's just a telephone visit um, that you would get through video. So I think that's kind of a, an obvious one. However, um, I would say in comparison to not having the option to do any kind of service for them or have, if it's telephone, it is, it is better than not being able to give the patient a session even though there are things that you'd like to be able to see, but um, there are also things that you can tell over the phone. You can, you're, you become more aware of their tone. Um, you just listen more almost because you know all you have is a voice to work with. Um, so I do think it's workable, especially if it's the only thing they have. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, and I think, um, I think it is probably one of the areas of, of research that is needed in terms of outcomes. Um, but it is, um, it's accessible. I think people are comfortable with it. Um, and it, uh, as Dr. DeGordon was saying, it does tap, tap into a different way of, of listening and being attentive in the session, you know, and to avoid that distraction of like, well, I can check an email because I'm on the phone. <laughs> you know, but, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. And I've even had a couple uh, people who not only because of technology didn't want to do um, the video, but I had a couple people with, I mean, the people that have a lot of social anxiety, sometimes it's a little bit intimidating to be, you know, on the, on the screen. Um, I even had a person with really, really, really low um, self image that had, didn't want to see herself doing it. So it's definitely even something that could be used um, clinically to try and, and it, it gives you some information that you probably wouldn't have had, or you might not have even seen that person to begin with if it wasn't over the phone. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, a question to come in, has there been any pushback about doing psych testing via telehealth? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Well, I, well <laughs> I, I would say, um, I don't know if there's been push, I haven't experienced at least, and I haven't heard pushback from, again, consumers or clients. I, I do think there have been um, concerns and questions by providers of how do we translate this, you know, um, and there have been some modifications made and some information put out by test developers of how to provide a set psychological testing of services um, remotely. It, yeah, and yet it also brings up questions about like test security and privacy. Um, so I, I guess my, that's my long way of saying no, but. <laughs> Dr. Gordon, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, w I, would, I would agree with that. I, we haven't seen too much. And with, with the kind of, um, we, we don't do very, um, some of the formal psychological testings. We do a lot of um, questionnaires and screenings and things like that that are more integrated because we're integrated into the primary care settings. And those we continue to do like the PHQ-9s and um, measuring for um, substance abuse and anxiety, which are more brief. Um, we will just do those over the phone. Mm -hmm. it, it, one thing um, to sort of add to that, because uh, you reminded me, Dr. Gordon, that at the South Los Angeles Trauma Recovery Center, uh, where I supervise students, prior to COVID, we had some of, uh, taken some of our outcome measures because we use things like the PHQ-9, which is what reminded me, as well as a trauma screening measure, the clients and our, the grant-funded project. And so the evaluator had already transitioned some of that to a tablet for ease of administration. And, and then we were able to kind of actually even put some of it online. And, and that was pre-COVID. So again, it made that transition easier. So we were still able to collect our outcome data from, from clients who are able to, on their smartphones, kind of go in and answer some of those questions and, and respond to it and, and get it to their clinician. Um, it, we weren't expecting to use it as widespread as we ended up having to, but I felt very um, grateful that we already had the um, sort of foundation of it in place. Uh, another question has come in. Have you done billable social work televisits in addition to behavioral and mental health? 
So we actually have, um, being a federally qualified health center, we are able to have social workers and they are the ones who are also doing therapy, just like our psychologists. Um, so it, it is, they are social workers, but they're providing therapy and they are billable um, in, F, in FQHCs. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a question that I've actually received a lot when people are starting off, like considering doing telehealth via, uh, mental health via telehealth. And that is, is, is there a type of patient where you would think would not be appropriate for telehealth? And one of their main concerns has been, someone who may be in a delicate state, but they may not have somebody there with them, like if they're in a clinic setting, where they can have like, you know, a, a medical assistant or nurse to go in and help them if they're in sort of like a, you know, where they need, may need like an extra bit of help. And now that we're in COVID, a lot of people are accessing this service from their home. Is there like a particular type of patient where you say like, maybe we shouldn't be doing the session over telehealth or what do you do in that situation where you're t engaging with a patient and over telehealth and there may be sort of like a delicate point where it might be good to have like another person there with them? Yeah, well, I, I think that, I mean, that's part of the reason why we like to have um, the emergency contact information for situations like this. I mean, we do have patients who are in very delicate states, and I think COVID has created a lot of delicate states for people where, you know, th this has just been a change for everybody and everybody has been affected. So um, I, I, do, I do think that there are some cases where it is not ideal to have, especially where, um, you know, maybe for example, if somebody is like severely, severely, um, let's say has, um, is in active psychosis, let's say, you know, being on a video would not be something that I would want, especially if there's paranoia or anything like that. And that would be something that I, that would be somebody who I would want to be seen in person. Um, and maybe somebody who needs to have, you know, their medication managed also regularly. So um, I don't think it is for everyone, especially when there's more severity of, um, of cases. I don't know, Dr. Woods, you, how you- I, I agree completely, yeah. Okay. And, and, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, we have another question. Do you allow new patients to start with telehealth visits or is first visit mandatory in person? I can speak in terms of, um, independent practice and, and, and somewhat in terms of clinics, the, the clinics at least that where I supervise, um, especially I think because of COVID, um, we, uh, we did conduct initial visits via telehealth. Um, and I think we accomplished that fairly effectively. Um, you know, again, some of those logistics that we had to navigate were things like consent. And I think Dr. Gordon's presentation spoke to how some of that was accomplished by like indicating and documenting getting verbal consent and, and following through those, um, using the guidelines from DHSC um, to facilitate some of that. But, but yes, we actually have been very um, uh, effective and, and, and I think it hasn't, it doesn't seem to have impacted the quality of care provided or even engagement of clients to um, begin treatment via telehealth. That's, that's been my experience, Dr. Gordon. Yeah, same. We we have we've had the same experience um, because our behavioral health providers aren't aren't going into the clinics. Um, all of our initial assessments are being done um, remotely, and you know I think it's just allow a little bit more time for that, um, and it's been it's been as effective. Uh, a follow up to that, I believe, is how about providing out of state telehealth for both new and existing patients? Which I don't know if either of you are doing that out-of-state patients? Well, well, the, the, the California law is that if the, um, well, I should say California law, because if you're in another state, uh, the state where the client is, is what guides the ability to provide the telehealth services. Um, and it gets really sort of complicated. So you need to know the laws of the state where the client is. Um, it did come up and some of the, the roles that I have, like I mentioned before with, whether it was some of the graduate students who were um, on placement on internships out of state and coming back to California. And so by that, they were now providing services out of state or even in some of my clients who had family that were out of state and to help to attend to family 
um, needed to travel out of state um, intermittently. So it's just really important to know what the laws are in the state um, where the client is. Uh, I, I personally, in my private practice, I would, I'm, I'm not licensed in any other state outside of California, so I would never initiate services with a client in another state. Um, but the, that, you know, other agencies or clinics may have other parameters to guide them, so. It's, it's similar where we are also, we, we're, not, um, we're not doing um, services for people that are, that are out of state, so it's just mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Wood, you had that great meme in your presentation of like who's underneath the mask and it's a, a Zoom, <laughs> Zoom <laughs> is underneath there. So, so a question did come in on like, how do you deal with Zoom fatigue? Because, you know, not only are we doing more things virtually, but also probably like a lot of your clients are too. And it does get tiring. Sometimes I feel like I'm just on Zoom constantly throughout the day. So how do providers, you as providers deal with Zoom fatigue? And have you had patients like bring that up saying like, you know, everything's virtual. I'm, this is yet another video conference that I'm having. Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually do, I was gonna say I haven't heard that from clients, but in some ways I have, as it relates to their own work, right? Because they also are probably working remotely as well. Uh, I think what I've done for myself is try to be intentional with workspace and, you know, getting a comfortable chair and addressing, trying to address issues like lighting and taking breaks and realizing that I needed breaks. I think I underestimated the need for that because, again, it, there was a convenience of, oh, no, I don't have to drive to another office. Um, and so it was, was sort of stacking up appointments. And, and whether it was clinical appointments with clients or meetings with students or in general, and realizing that I, I needed to incorporate a lot, a lot more breaks. And um, actually going into the summer, I've tried to schedule a day with no meetings, it, you know, sort of intermittently um, successful. <laughs> um, and, and, and honestly, with some of my friends just saying like, yeah, I know this idea of doing this sort of Zoom heavy hour is like attractive, but if we could just actually talk on the phone, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Gordon, any tips? Yeah, I would agree with that also. And I was going to say, we're not hearing it from the patients. We're hearing it from the providers. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, some of the, you know, you hear like, I just need to get up and go to the bathroom really quickly. And, and we do a lot of um, brief, so 30 minutes. So for follow-ups, we're doing 30 minutes back to back. The initials are, are an hour. But um, it, it has been a change because yes, going back to what Dr. Wood said, we, we, are, we are in the comfort of our home. However, um, all of our patients are also showing up. So that mm -hmm. has been different as well. Everybody mm -hmm. is reasonable, everybody is um, accessible. And so while it's great because more people are getting services, we are also busier than ever, kind of as, this, as the slides showed. So I think there is a little bit more, um, we are hearing about more fatigue amongst the providers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have time for one more question and one question to come through in the chat box. It's um, from Robert Klein. Assessment of telehealth for autism therapy services participants. So that's what the question says. But have, have either of you um, treated a patient, an, an autistic patient, at any time via telehealth? No, I, I have not either. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder and, if regional center would probably be a good um, mm -hmm. to see what they are doing now during this time. I'm not really sure. Yeah. Okay. So we do have like just one final question. This is from me to both of you. And that is, you've heard probably this phrase brought out a lot. Is the genie out of the bottle now for telehealth with like all these changes, whether they stick around or not? You got more people using telehealth. What are your thoughts on that? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say I think so, but yeah, I I, I think so. Um, you know, and one thing that I, I didn't mention in uh, my presentation is that, you know, there are also all these other platforms that specialize. And when I say platform, I mean services, you know, some online telehealth services that that did exist pre-COVID and I, I so I think yes the genie is is out of the bottle all right then well I want to thank again the wonderful presentations by both Dr. Gordon and Dr. Wood 
Also, our generous sponsors, the California Healthcare Foundation, the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers, and everybody who attended today. This webinar is being recorded. It will be posted on the website along with the PowerPoints. Um, so thank you, everyone. And please look forward to future webinars from the coalition. Thank you once again, Dr. Gordon and Dr. Wood. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day, everyone.